Hello, and welcome to this Let's Play series of Space Quest 4. Oh, that's right. I've been told it's bad form to show the DOS prompt. Ooh. But I don't want to interrupt the intro either, though, so I guess we'll talk afterward. Join our friend and semi-hero Roger Wilco as he rockets back toward his home planet Xenon, which he hasn't seen since Space Quest II. Having successfully rescued those two ingrates from Andromeda, he decides a pit stop on Magmetheus is in order. During the descent to this cosmic canteen, he is unaware of the interest that has been generated regarding his fate. Confirmation of his position, Master. Off to Magnetheus with you then. It is time for Wilco to meet the fate which I have crafted for him. As our story begins, we find the aluminum mallard parked outside a seedy spaceport barn. We join Roger as he relates one of his greatly exaggerated tales of adventure. The aliens are only too happy to listen, as long as Roger is by. See, there is this deadly root monster, a ferocious swamp creature, and a Labion terror beast to contend with. Then I had to outsmart another of Vohal's gorillas and steal the shuttle so I could penetrate the asteroid fortress and pull the plug on that corpulent creep once and for all. Yeah, all in a day's work for a guy like me. Anyway, I aborted the launch and jetted out of there in an escape pod. I crawled into the sleep chamber, and the next thing I knew, I woke up in a trash freighter. Yeah, things didn't look too good, but I blasted out of the freighter in an old jalopy I resurrected from the rubble. What I didn't know was I was being tailed by Arnoid the Annihilator, that one-man collection agency from hell. He nearly had me at a tourist trap on Flea Butt, but at the last minute, I wiped him out. After that grueling experience, I thought I'd take it easy for a while. That's when I got the distress call from the two guys from Andromeda. Ever seen those guys? Jeez, what a couple of geeks. Anyway, before I knew it, I was face to face with the most ruthless band of outlaws in the galaxy, the Pirates of Pestilon. I was lucky to get out of there with my skin, not to mention those two ingrates I dropped off on Earth. Why I risked my neck for those bozos, I'll never know. Yeah, I think I'm overdue for a vacation. I'm not even going to think about anything brave or heroic for at least, uh, six months. I'll be kicking back on some sandy beach, soaking up x-rays. Heck, maybe I'll even check out Roberta Land. Are you Roger Wilco? Uh, yeah. Please come with me. Hello, Roger Wilco. 
Surprised to see an old friend? You have no idea how special this moment is for me. This is no chance encounter, I can assure you. I have this one loose end to tie up before I begin my reign as the supreme being of all that exists. I do not like to lose. You are a blemish on what would otherwise be a perfect record of domination, terror, and invincibility. Besides, I'm still a bit miffed about that asteroid deal in Space Quest 2. Anyway, to relieve the pain of my humiliation and to prevent you from being a pain in my... future, you must die. It's been nice seeing you one last time. Then, do the dirty deed. You go left and split them up. Mr. Wilco, follow me and do exactly as I say. Let's move! Hey, I wanna know what the... Listen, I can't explain it all to you now. They've got a beat on our coordinates. We've got to move fast. We gotta do this fast. Shield your eyes! Jump into the time rip! Do it now! You've got to! If I take the time to explain, we're both parking lot pizza! You'll understand soon. Now where am I, you wonder aloud to non-existent auditory organs? This place sure looks homey. Hey, wait, this looks just like Xenon. It is Xenon. It's, it's, it's really a pile. Along with the changes induced by an armed conflict, the city looks different, more modern with a heavy dash of post-disaster seasoning. Casually glancing at the status line, you happen to notice that you're in Space Quest 12. What's happened? Who was that guy with the overdeveloped hair dryer? Why did you let yourself be talked into jumping into some strange shimmering hole? Why are you talking to yourself? These incredibly intriguing questions will quickly be forgotten with barely an electron stirred in that well-armored orb atop your shoulders. Okay, now, welcome to Space Quest for, er, well, <clears throat> we hardly knew ye. Um, to start things off, you notice that I paused the game at the bar. Normally, the policeman interrupts Roger early on in that speech, but here I interrupted the policeman, allowing you to hear what many players never do. Just about any key other than enter or escape will do the trick. And clicking doesn't work either. I guess that's why it's so obscure, those are the buttons you normally reach for. Huh. Still going. Anyway, this game, whatever it is, was first released on floppy disk in 1991, though the CD version with all the speech added came out a year later. The creators of this series were none other than the very two guys from Andromeda mentioned in the intro. One calls himself Mark Crow, and the other is Scott Murphy, aka Rand Miller's evil twin. So it's a good thing Roger rescued them in Space Quest 3, or else there would have never been any space quests. Try not to think about it too much. But it does mean that you and I here are jumping face first right into the heart of an already convoluted non-linear paradoxical time pretzel. Ah oh well, it won't be the first time I've been criticized for skipping games in a series. But who cares anyway? The first three games were all parser interface, and I just end up dying all the time. We're 
are glad you could play Space Quest 4. As usual, you've been a real pet load. Well, isn't this a hoot? We currently have more deaths than mouse clicks. How often does that happen? Actually, that would make a good first homework assignment for you viewers out there. In what other adventure games can you achieve a game over screen without actually telling your character to do anything? I can think of a few, but I want to see what you guys come up with. Meanwhile, I'm going to start actually playing now. Are you sure you want to restart? <laughs> Why would I need a warning now? Oh, before I ran out of time there, I meant to mention that I'm playing the CD version, but with the unofficial 1.2 patch installed. Credit goes to New Rising Sun for creating it. I'll talk about the variations between the different versions as we go along, but one is right here on this screen. VGA graphics generally use 256 colors, but something something technical, not all shades of red were available in the CD release. So the art on this screen turns out to be slightly different in that version. But 1.2 puts the missing colors back into the game, allowing them to reinstate the original art as well. That's kind of the point. You know what, I'm gonna die again if I don't start moving here. Uh... Eh, the icon bar pauses the game. Actually, this game was gonna be another parser interface until Ken Williams forced their hand. Ken Williams was the founder of Sierra, in case you were living under an asteroid. Anyway, let's take the tutorial! This icon is for walking. Way to bring the enthusiasm, Mark Siebert. Yeah, this is just how you get around. Although, in my opinion, he's moving a bit slow. Fortunately, we can do something about this. There's a setting for it in the menu here. This icon brings up the control panel. Yeah, this is just your standard array of game controls. But all I want to do right now is bump up the speed a little bit. I'm uh, not all the way to the max because while I do want him to be efficient, I don't want him to look too stupid, if that's possible. Maybe not. And then as far as this display mode goes, it's kind of a generic sounding term, but all it does is control how the voices are handled. In the original CD version, you could choose to either hear the voices as speech or read them on the screen as text. Obviously, you had to have text with floppies because of disk space. But the 1.2 patch does allow you to have both speech and text simultaneously, which is kind of nice, I guess, and I know a lot of people prefer it, but I actually don't like both because to me it comes across as voice actors just reading off the script. Kind of loses its effect. So I'm just going to put it back on speech as it was before. And it's slightly confusing because this is what the current mode actually is, while the button just shows what it'll toggle to next. Yeah, that speed is pretty reasonable. So let's go on to the next icon. This icon is for looking. Now this command would have been really useful in older games when you only had 16 colors and unintelligible blobs on the screen and no idea how to refer to these blobs using the parser. But here, I don't know, I guess it's at least as good for vanity purposes. It's you, Roger Wilco, Space Guy. Okay, maybe it's not the only thing. A twisted and broken expanse of cityscape stretches south from here negating possible travel plans in that direction. And sometimes you'll get an overall description of the scenery, when it has nothing to say about the part you clicked on. You are in the southern area of a rare clearing in this destroyed cityscape. Your home as you remember it does not exist in this period of time. A huge boil of a structure clogs the horizon. Okay, next one. Ah, uh, oh boy. Well, if you leave him alone, he'll leave you alone, right? Er... This icon is for doing. Yes, in general, this is your all-purpose interact with everything within reach on the screen command. But it won't do the action we probably should be doing right now. But we're not. 
Hey, keep your hands off yourself. This is a family game. How metaphorical. The rubble is rough and jagged. No sense in risking injury this early in the adventure. We'll get to that in due time. Eek. It appears that the speed setting has affected my future self as well. Um, do we have time to get another command in? Oh, let's go for it. This icon is for talking. Hey, I'm over here. He seems to be unaware of your existence, as though he is controlled by some other consciousness. Well, he's not going to be unaware of our existence for much longer if we don't go back to the Hall Ass command. Hey, you said ass! It's okay, I was talking about a donkey. Okay, he's probably already past us now. Yep, there he goes. And I am going to slip on over to the other side of the screen. I assume if he comes back, he'll enter from the left side next time, so I'd like him to not ambush me, please. Anyway, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, we weren't actually done with this one yet. All I had left to say about it was, look at where the tip of the mouse pointer is right now. That's the hotspot that registers when you click. But when I select this, the hotspot ends up above the back of his head. In other games, you usually click the mouth on what you want to talk to. So this is just a little awkward. So that's how it works. Now, if only we had someone to talk to. Oh, hello there. What's your name? It's too cool to talk to you. Ouch. That one's gonna sting for a while. So much for having a fuzzy companion. As it is, we must keep ourselves company. You talk to yourself, but are stumped for a reply. Okay. Let's continue our loneliness. I mean, tutorial. This icon is for smelling. Ooh, don't underestimate the power of the nose. Like the eye, it is an input command, useful for information gathering. Just in case you didn't know, I don't know how things work on your planet. You inhale deeply and detect the aroma of very old traffic. The snappy scent of freshly chopped buildings fills the air. That's how you immerse yourself in the environment. Inhale all the local toxins. Ah, the aroma of several adventure games emanates from your person. But maybe there's an even better way. This icon is for tasting. Which makes it yet another passive information gathering icon except this one sometimes leaves a mark. I have a slight suspicion the two guys put these gag commands in to get back at Ken Williams for taking away the freedom inherent in the parser interface, but hey, it all works out well for us. You lick a thick smear of filth off the street. Finding the taste unpleasant, you quickly swallow it. What a smart person you are. And by us, I met the players. Didn't say anything about the characters. I'll bet you wish you could. This window displays the current inventory item. Yeah, whatever that means. This icon brings up the inventory window. Yes, this displays all the baggage we carried into this mess. No, 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 we're not doing this. I just got through painstakingly stepping through each of the main commands. I think you can figure out what these do. But interestingly, Roger brought the one thing all adventure game protagonists should bring, but most never do. He brought money to a world with no economy. In the form of 59 gold coins. Buckazoids. Bitcoins. Ah yes, we are still on the taste command. The wreckage left by the destruction of the entire Xenon civilization tastes a little like some ancient ruins you once sampled. Up oh, here he comes. I'll outsmart him every time. Okay, let's start exploring now that we're done with the tutorial. Er, almost done with the tutorial. One last thing, if you right-click, it goes to the next available command in the icon bar. 
You stand centrally located in perhaps the only debris clear area on the surface of this city. This was a busy intersection of commerce when times were happier and life, well, just existed. An odd structure looms in the distance. That's interesting that we get the generic description there. But I guess the part about the giant red dome was included. In the distance, not so fortunate buildings barely stand in ruin. At the moment, it's not clear how we would access any of the above. You see a rubble barrier to the north. He's taunting me. A brightly colored mechanical hare wanders about. But I want him. The hare, anticipating your clumsy attempt to catch it in the open barehanded, won't come anywhere near you. It appears we are overmatched. It's tough when you have both an inferior body and an inferior brain. But somehow, we will get him. Oh hey, let's see if there's a description for the lightning. Lightning strikes the large, wart-shaped behemoth. Its distance away is great enough to demonstrate the travel time difference between light and sound. Yeah, you'd have to be rather profoundly unobservant not to notice that phenomenon already. Anyway, let's get back to the buildings. It looks like only two of them are accessible on this side of the rubble bubble. A once prosperous bank building stands partially erect and sealed shut. The relatively undamaged building shows no entrances. Let's go to that one, it's closer. Besides, I already have money. Uh, whoops, I just did something that I also forgot to mention in the tutorial. If you hit the middle mouse button, or the scroll wheel these days, it switches back and forth between walk and whatever icon you last used. A featureless, dirty white structure fills space to the east. Featureless? No entrances? It's almost like the game is telling me this is a waste of time. You are at the northeastern boundary of a clearing in the midst of a battle-scarred city. The massive wart-like complex in the background is the only thing in sight which appears to contain life. Now, the fact that there are only like three pixels on the screen that give the generic description makes me think that they may have tried to remove it from the game completely but failed. After all, it is kind of weird, isn't it? For one, we don't actually see the lumpy red tower in the background from this angle. And two, I'm not so certain the rest of Xenon is completely devoid of life. But at least the part about it being the northeastern boundary was probably right. I don't think there's going to be any way we can brute force our way through here. The rubble is rough and jagged. Your species wasn't designed to traverse this kind of terrain. Yeah, that's what I thought. Ugh, here we go. Get away from me. Wait, I have an idea. This is the only form of actual life that you've seen here. Its clothes are tattered, and a grotesque metal contraption is clamped to its head, which serves to hold the eyelids permanently open. To me, it sounds like that means he always knows where he's going. So instead of running away from him, maybe we should actually be following him. And he'll lead us to some secret area or something. Just gotta stay out of his line of sight, so... I'll stay on the opposite side as we walk down this street. What? Serious damage to important body parts pretty much screws up any future plans you might have had for living. Bummer. Oh well, just think proudly of your accomplishment. On second thought, just think. It even happens to important people. Important people get faked out by zombies? Even I'm not falling for that comforting lie.